All right. Did you, I hope you had a chance to look over the essay. Can't speak, but I don't mind listening for now while I draw. Oh, that sounds lovely. I should be drawing sometime soon. That would be lovely. I'm teaching an art class in about two hours, so that'll be fun. Nope, this is my first time. Usually when things are going on, I'm busy at work. Ah, I understand. Well, welcome, and I'm glad you're here. Um, so it's all right if you didn't get a chance to read the essay I or the book at all. It's I feel like they're very standalone. You can learn a lot from them, even with a little bit of information. Uh, just as a reminder, the book that this essay comes from is called Beyond Anger, How to Hold On to Your Heart and Your Humanity in the Midst of Injustice. Well, the essay we're looking over today is called I Take Up the Way of Letting Go of Anger. Um, so this is sort of chapter two of the book. Um, I like the way that this begins. It has a student's rendition of the vowel. Anger no longer seems a lunatic stranger locked in the basement, but a familiar shadowy twin who suddenly appears in the room in unexpected guises. I now recognize anger as a frequent visitor in my life. Um, the way, the personification of anger through this journey um, of this chapter is really interesting and absolutely worth a look into um, if you get the chance to read it, if you haven't yet. What follows next? A few pages of this book is not going to teach you how to wipe anger out of your life. I think that's a really great introduction. Um, this makes, and it also makes this point again with a couple of the antidotes it uses throughout the chapter of how it's not about wiping out anger that you have, um, but about meeting the anger, but not inviting it to dinner, I suppose, uh, to fit some of the analogies that happen throughout the chapter. Um, the Buddhist vow or precept for working with inner energy is often worded as do not indulge in anger, but the point of this precept is not to stuff or deny the anger, but to come to understand it intimately so that you can take a more skillful action in its presence, which I think is an excellent thing to teach people of any particular belief system, any walk. I, I, I don't see it as a 100% Buddhist thing. I think it's a teaching that can be taken out into just about any belief system because it holds such a beautiful truth in it of how one can approach anger in a healthy and meaningful manner. I saw you about to type something. You're more than welcome to interrupt me at any time. I know I have a ranting luxury voice and that is because I am a certified K-12 art teacher and I, uh, I am used to needing to command the room, if you will, but I will keep an eye on chat if you do say anything. Um, so with that, um, th this precept, this idea of spotting the difference between a self-centered anger and a life-centered anger. I thought that was a really fascinating approach for the chapter to take. Um, it wasn't just about anger as one thing, but it broke it down into the types of anger. I know that we've had a discussion like that in the Sangha before where it was effectively, are you failing at enlightenment if you get angry? And I think that this chapter does a lovely job of approaching that subject. It's that the life-centered anger while still capable of an overwhelming presence in your life, can have a more useful momentum to it than the self-centered anger. I'm reminded of the song Monster by Skillet. Oh, that's a great one. Oh, good one. Good choice. Um, it's scratching on the walls, in the closet, in the halls. It comes awake and I can't control it. Oh, my, that is a good song. Choose. <laughs> Sorry, I love that song. Um love that song and I think it's an excellent <laughs> sorry <laughs> love that song um, I think that's an excellent choice to compare this chapter with um, it's this clawing gnawing thing that you can you can hear and you, can, you can't control it sometimes uh, it's this physiological response that just happens inside of you um, absolutely uh, anyone who listens to this recording later go look up monster by skillet i would play it for you now except i will get this video muted if i do that so that's not we don't want that <laughs> but absolutely look it up uh so but absolutely i can see how that sing it <laughs> sing it my angel of music sing for me <laughs> it's a really good song though I can it's got a lot of meaningful insight into how those feelings can what feelings in general like anger 
especially, but just like what it can feel like to try to approach your feelings and your emotions that are rising up inside of you and are becoming un uncontrollable. So I think it's very good reflective song. I've certainly listened to it in times where I've felt incredibly emotional. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. It is a good analogy. Yeah. Like anything else, we can't understand something that we do not investigate. I thought that that was awesome. So what I liked about that idea is that the author isn't saying you can never, <laughs> you can never taste anger. Um, you sh it's not that you can never, I'm trying to define it without using the word in the sentence that was used. <laughs> it is difficult. Uh, it's not about pushing it away or stuffing it. It's investigation. It's finding the um, patterns and the think thought processes that you can identify that rise up in you. Um, anger, like any other human emotion, is a natural occurrence. It is possible to experience its power and force without being destroyed or caught by it. Um, there's just so much good teaching going on in this particular chapter that I will end up quoting it quite a lot. I find that while I am articulate when I need to be, words fail me, and I find that books are a lovely place to bounce off of with words and truth. Um, to practice this precept, to let go of anger, is to come to know its workings in and through us and experience its energy in our lives. This is the way of letting go of anger. So you're not just going to shove it aside. You're going to experience it in its natural currents and then let it go. And so this is just such an interesting way of talking about anger because I think we're so used to, at least in the United States, um, we are so used to this idea of I can never show anger, I can never feel anger, I've got to push it aside, I've got to get rid of it. And so to have somebody so clearly state that you can in fact feel that anger and there's a way to move through it is very important I think rather than saying no you can never experience it in the first place as we can see from this uh, there's a story that is told about a being who is prone to quick temper going into a frenzy and the uh, emotions that go through this and so there's anger that can dupe us into chasing all types of shadows right like our anger tricks us if it rises up in a unpredictable manner it can trick our behavior and push us into places that we're not as equipped to handle I suppose uh, I think you see this this is pretty much used all over Hollywood movies right like the the jealous spouse who's risen up into an unbelievable uncontrollable rage and either does something irreconcilable like murder or just generally comes at like lashes out at their spouse without reason or without figuring out the truth of the situation right so it's a tricky emotion for many of us uh, to hold the belief that any situation is wrong, unacceptable, and spiritual, dangerous, or should be squelched at its earliest sign, right? So we that's a, that's a common belief for people to hold, I believe, especially, like I said, especially here in the United States, um, to believe that you have to squelch anger as soon as you even possibly feel it because it's not right, it's not okay, it's immoral, right? We've, we, we've come to label anger as this immoral thing. Yes, yes, and I think that that's an absolutely, um, I'm going to call you Prince, because I'm not good with the first word that you used in your username. So Prince, that's a great uh, point of anger as a symptom of something that's hurting inside of us. I think that more often than not, that's true of almost every negative emotion that comes out of a person. And when possible, um, I, try, I do personally try really hard to see that when people are behaving in a manner that I don't either, either I don't inherently approve of on the surface or that feels off. And so to recognize that a person who hurts, who's afraid, whose unconscious world you are unaware of, something's going on there and realize that the symptom is that behavior that you don't like, right? It's that thing coming out of them that isn't fun, isn't, isn't wonderful, lovely times, right? And so having the patience to realize that it's a, it's a symptom, it's a sickness, and I think we see that um, to get into the more Buddhisty 
<laughs> Buddhist, more Buddhist terminology. Uh, that's that's uh, that's Deca, I believe. Uh, we we talked about the last book we read was an introduction to Buddhism, and now I've forgotten everything I learned from it. I don't know why it's so hard for my mind. <laughs> it's just like water; it just pours out, and I have no idea what words are anymore. Samsara, Samsara is like the gross stuff of the world. Is Ducka the good stuff or the bad stuff? I don't remember. Somebody will tell me later, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, I know Samsara is definitely the bad stuff. We don't want that. Well, we have to do it. Anyway, Buddhism is weird. For me, it seems like anger is more deceptive symptom. When you cry, you're sad or happy, but anger seems so much more complicated. I think that this chapter actually gets into that really quickly. Um, some of us wear anger like an armband, signaling to others, don't mess with me, right? So you, if I'm hurting inside, I don't want you to mess with me, right? So I'm using it as a shield. And I think that that's exactly what you're saying, where um, it's more complicated than that. And anger can rise out of a stack of dirt. <laughs> oh, that's a different one. So I'm, let me, let me find... Um, Anger could also be a signal to uh, that alerts us to how we may be mistreated. Um, so a little bit later in this chapter, the author gets into this idea that anger also can be a signal to us, to ourselves, that the situation is off. So we might be like, why am I angry about this? I'm almost never angry. Or like, I really thought I'd gotten my anger under control. It can be a warning to us in some ways that we've not consciously perceived something off about the situation and so that anger can signal to us i'm not being treated well um and can in that way i believe be a more healthy uh tool in its own right um but that is a slightly bit of a tangent um my anger <laughs> this is where he talks about more of kind of the self-centered aspects of anger i believe uh, about it could, I like how he starts it, uh, he or she, the author starts it. Anger can rise out of a stack of dirty dishes or our housemates leave in the sink. The homework our kids forgot. Or bombings and useless slaughters. So it can be from something mundane to something extreme. So we've got, um, it masks, its mask of power covers fear and powerlessness. And so there, I think that's almost, that's what you're saying as well. Um, that the anger itself is this attempt to be powerful in the face of powerlessness. And so um, that it's, it's absolutely deceptive in that way. We may try to avoid it, ignore it, hang on to it. We may identify it as yours or mine, right? So we, we, we claim ownership of the anger. This is my anger. <laughs> um, this is your anger. And if you identify as an angry person, as the uh, student in this analogy that the author tells us, then it can be a psychological occurrence right and so when you identify too strongly as an angry person or as seeing somebody as an angry person it can really um, muddle up thoughts and be a type of indulging in the anger and so um, do, 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 do reading to remind myself of what was said do, da, do, da. But if we are clear in our intention to come to know where we stand in anger, then something over time begins to change. So we understand that it's like a blip on the radar rather than this continuous line of who we are as a person. Um, we learn that we can grow closer without being scorched or by pretending there is no fire. So you don't you don't want to get so close that you burn yourself, but you don't want to pretend that the fire isn't there and isn't a real danger. And so um, immediately the author goes into explaining what that difference is of the life-centered versus self-centered angers. And so that's really nice. I'll pause for a second while you type up your thought. Take a drink of my minty tea here. I can see that it could be due to wrongdoing. What if that wrongdoing is in your head? You feel someone is ignoring you or suspect that they have bad thoughts about you. I think that's exactly what the author was talking about earlier. Let me scoot back. Like anything else, we can't understand any, something that we do not investigate. I think in this way, um, where it, it couldn't be an indication that we're being mistreated, but also an indication that we may not have all the information necessary. I just really get caught up. It's fine. <laughs> but also that, you know, it can be an indication that we don't have in 
enough information. A lot of anger can be born out of a lack of information, at least in my personal belief. Obviously, any extra commentary I throw on here should be taken with a grain of salt because I am no master of anything. All I do is read books and analyze them because I like that. That's just what I like to do. <laughs> That's why they put me in charge of this. Um, so just a grain of salt. Uh, oftentimes, my thoughts are formed in a vacuum. So in this way, I like to use the text itself while I bounce ideas around. But yeah, I, I think the conversation could be, you're so good at speaking though. I know, it's all of my training as a teacher is amazing. Also, I'm a Twitch streamer, so it makes it really easy to learn how to monologue to myself and to whoever I believe might be watching me. I pretend I have an audience of 100 usually, and I have to entertain quite a few people in that way. All right, so here we go. But yeah, I think that you've got a great point. Um, you can feel these negative emotions based on what you're presuming another's behavior to be. But then you get into this whole... So then that's where, like, to me, Buddhism gets really difficult to discuss on, on, in that way. Because ideally, what that would really mean, and, and beyond Buddhism, because I never want to presume that anyone in this book... <laughs> it's funny, we're in a server called the D Sangha, but I never want to presume that somebody's coming at these with a Buddhist belief system. So... Um, so within Buddhism, but then I believe also with, with, um, outside of it, it's important to not hold too many uh, attachments to the ideas that you have from people. One of the greatest, one of the greatest, uh, indicators or creators of discontent and frustration is a unmet expectation. As I went through therapy a few years ago, I found that one of the worst things <laughs> that would bring me anger towards like my spouse or towards a friend or a sibling or whoever was this unmet expectation I had built up in my head right Un <laughs> yes right so even if the and that doesn't mean it's positive or negative right you have an expectation of what their behavior means what it what it's to do what they should do what they shouldn't do right and so I have this unmet expectation if my expectation is that my husband should be a good husband who always does his dishes every single day without leaving them in the sink more than five hours, then I'm going to get really frustrated being married to that expectation. Does that mean that I stop having standards in the house? No. <laughs> but it does mean that I'm not attached to that expectation. I would still encourage a good sense of cleanliness in the home, but my anger doesn't rise at it anymore because it's not an expectation I have tied myself to. It's not one that I feel that defines me or our home. Instead, I'm able to bring love and compassion to those scenarios. Am I always doing that? No, I don't. I haven't mastered this yet. I'm working really hard on it though. <laughs> this is one of the things I'm like consciously working on is being less mad at how dirty my husband can be. Um, and I use him only because he is the most immediately close person in my life capable of raising up all of these negative emotions of me it's funny how i can go about my day-to-day -day life with strangers and feel like i'm this perfect buddhist of zen right and then you're like faced with somebody who's actually close to you and they just r boil inside of you like i hate you why are you doing this to me would the anchor produced by unmet expectation be part of the first noble truth right view yes actually that's an absolutely great comparison i'm glad you brought that up prince prince uh just to quote again says, would the anger produced by unmet expectation be part of the first noble truth, right view? Absolutely. As we learn to attune our minds to the world and to the realities of the world, that expectations are an attachment, I think that is part of aligning your view. Um, as I've noticed, it seems in Buddhism, many things have like an, are just an umbrella phrase that encapsulates a great deal of ideas. So having a right view is a complicated, um, it's a complicated series of steps. It's not just, boom, I believe this one thing, I got the right view, done. Uh, that's not how it seems to work, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would be an excellent Buddhist. Um, I'd be done. I'd be enlightened. That would be great. I'm down for it. Okay. <laughs> done, everybody. I'm enlightened. End of, end of book club. I don't have to do this anymore. Um, no. So we have, like, the right view, right? And so that's a complicated thing. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I would think it would be amazing, Prince. 
Oh. Oh, it'd be amazing. Um. With the end of the research. Yes. But I think in that case, it's almost just a matter of semantics, right? I've just chosen a different set of words to define things in order for them to be palatable to my mind. And somebody else says it a little differently. And so I think also not being attached to the way we phrase things is really important. That just, this is a tangent, completely aside from anger, everybody. Uh, if it were that simple, it'd be great. Uh, so not being attached too hard to the way we phrase things and really the, realizing the flexibility of words and their usage, I think personally is an important part of uh, our interactions with people as we learn together, but especially in somewhere like the, the Sangha where I know a lot of people are from different places around the world and our understanding of the English we're using here can be a little different. And so where I say unmet expectation, frequently we'll read in Buddhist texts where it says attachment. Um, but when I was going through a lot of therapy a few years ago, I found that when I could realize what things had become expectations, whether they were positive or negative, it became a lot easier for me to deal with. Yeah, <laughs> DBT therapy, yeah. Um, yes, I had that too, yay. <laughs> yay, I, on a, okay, tangent, everybody should know. Des is of the opinion that everybody can absolutely find some value in therapy. Everybody should go. Go to therapy at some point in your life. You probably need it. Anyway, <laughs> but beside that, uh, Des had a whirlwind of a childhood. Crazy ride, right? So in adulthood, I've finally had the time to kind of deal with some stuff. And so, anyway. <laughs> uh, it's been lovely. Also, um, because of my wild ride of a childhood, I have some bad coping mechanisms that I have found a lot of solace in, in Buddhism and also therapy. And I find that it's... Oh, yeah, some form of DBT taught in school would be a great idea, Prince. Oh, yeah. Um, man, there's a lot of things I wish they taught in school. A lot of things. Taxes. Have, like, all of the ins and outs of tax law. I kind of wish I'd known more about that before becoming an adult. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Yes. Therapy. Therapy? Do it. It's good. Oh, yes. I find that a lot of the things taught in DBT are actually shockingly similar to the Buddhist path. And so that's why I try to talk about it pretty openly. Because I think that they ha it has applicability beyond seeing it as just a like faith practice. It is just a good practice. Like, <laughs> it, is, it has worth beyond the, the, um, the word Buddhism. Like, and so, it, yeah. And so I was, I was tentatively interested in Buddhism. I learned more about DBT and then Buddhism itself became like, this is how you turn DBT into a daily practice. <laughs> Siddhartha Gautama is now my spiritual beacon. Yes. Excellent. Brought me back. Also, there's a lot similar to stoicism too. Yeah. So there's, there's just, I think being open-minded about that is really important. And, um, I think that you can, so this is, this, let me, let me just rant for a second. I'll tell you, this is what brings me to book club, is that I think that there's truth everywhere, right? I think there's truth hidden in the pages of just about every book that I can get my hands on. And so I find it lovely to hopscotch between both Buddhist texts and more secular texts. We've been sitting very, um, since, I start, since we started having the book club here in the Sangha, uh, I have kept it very Buddhist-centric. But in the past, when I've held this book club and other on other servers and in other platforms, we have had a more secular book selection. And I believe that it had a lot of lovely Buddhist truth within it. Um, it's just having the um, open mind, I think, to see that the nuggets don't have to rely on the full context if, if it doesn't. I don't know. It's just I'm not saying pick and choose necessarily. It's a little different than that. But um, coming from like my ch my Christian upbringing, if you will, uh, it's that truth is true no matter where it's said, and um, that's kind of where I, I sit. Stoicism is like ancient Greek Buddhism. My name, 
Aurelius is inspired by a Roman emperor who practiced it all his life, which helped him become a great virtuous ruler, says Prince. Or Aurelius Prince, for those of you who can't see Discord right now. Yeah, that's a great um, pattern to look towards, I think, is a little like ancient Greek Buddhism. Yeah, Stoicism is. Truth is truth! That is that is our mod that is our secret motto here in book club. And now that you've attended book club, then you know the secret motto is truth is truth. <laughs> it doesn't stop being truth just because a hobo said it. <laughs> I say in a lot of our famous philosophers that we know about are, are hobos. Anyway, <clears throat> wearing anger like an armband. Explore some of the beliefs we have about anger. You should do that. You should explore your beliefs about anger. Highly recommend to everybody. We talked about anger being in some dirty dishes. Uh, being clear in our intent. Oh, yes. Life-centered and self-centered anger. That's where we were rolling up into. Um, when for people first take up the precept... The concern about when anger is okay and when it's not always seems to present a conundrum. I have seen this so many times with newer uh, people to the practice. Uh, huh. Maxon's coming up. <clears throat> when people first take up... So I see this a lot when people first come up into the practice. Um, I think most of us would like a tidy list of appropriate angers and inappropriate angers. But when are the emotions of life situations ever that simple? Uh, Prince and I just talked about that. Wouldn't it be simple and great if I just had to do X, Y, Z and boom, I knew I'm already there. I'm done. All right. Like this list. I like things to be clean cut like that. <laughs> the key is really to know whether the anger motivates action that benefits the well-being of others or if the anger motivates actions that are hurtful to others and only interested in your in self um so one action we can say is life-centered the action of we can call self-indulgent life-centered anger has the power to be open and transformative it can serve as a wake-up call it rises and falls quickly and is never held on to um ba -ba 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 -da -ba -ba. Life-centered anger is filled with potential for useful action. It grows in intensity as we indulge our thinking and action from within it. Its price is a closed heart and mind. So um, in this, he's responding to the MAD um, Society or the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Its mission is to stop drunk driving, support victims, and prevent underage drinking. Um, however... And additionally, this anger towards this rage towards these actions and these events that have happened have caused action activism that has resulted in the passage of federal and state anti-drinking laws, which have contributed to saving many lives. So in that way, we would call that a life-centered anger, right? Like that anger is not self-serving. It is a life-centered, motivating anger to bring about healing and safety to others, right? Um, life. Then he talks about life-serving anger's power. Um, it's a clear example of the difference between... Do, 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 da, 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 somebody take this story to illustrate how enlightened the old man was. That he didn't become angry even when his horse struggle barged his way into his hut. I'm reading now. <laughs> When anger's energy is self-centered, it can alert us to situations that go against our deep sense of what serves life. Um, and so in this way, it can tell us if it is something that ends life um, or the lives of others. Bum, bum, bum. This author in this chapter uses a ton of analogies. And I don't want to go over every analogy because I think that it can be a little overwhelming. I know that when I first read this chapter, I had to reread the pages, the sections like three or four times before I fully absorbed them. Because it was just like analogy, 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 story, story, story. And I was like, this is too much. Too many stories for deaths. I want one story. <laughs> um, so I had to read it a few times before it all sunk in. When we do pay attention, the open free flame transforms into powerful energy that ignites skillful action. Oh, I like that. The response to circumstances, they truly present themselves in the present time. Anger can also be a signal that alerts us to how we may be mistreated, which is something I was bringing up earlier, Prince. 
of uh, it can shine the light to the unacceptable. It can show us abusive situations. It can be a gift, a trigger to remove ourselves from the situation. Um, but as I said earlier, at least here in the United States, I, I, I know that I've experienced this covering up of anger and not allowing ourselves to experience it. Um, blaming ourselves for a misconceived notion rather than um, and rather than take care of the situation we've been motivated to handle through the anger. Um, then he goes into an account from a battered uh, spouse. When we measure our well-being by extent to which we maintain our requirement. Oh, here we go. This one's good. This is a good sentence. Oh, you're going to type something. I will wait. Do -do. Was there a mention about how to quell sudden bursts of anger and you are so tempted to lash out? Asks Aurelius Prince. Um, I cannot recall at this time. I would like to come back to your question. Um, I do know that as a... I'm just going to put you both there to remind myself to look at that question again in a second. Um... Yes, DBT therapy does have you wait. And in this way, I think that's where mindfulness meditation itself is a very broad, has a very broad application to these sorts of wild emotions. Um, so by practicing our mindfulness, by practicing in meditation, we feel, we know, we see the anger as it arises, right? Um, the burst typically isn't going to be as much of a burst if we are in the present moment with ourselves and with the situation. Um, I know like even when I've had suddenly I'm in pain, anger doesn't necessarily rise so much as like that's a lot of pain I'm in and I'm just aware of it. <laughs> so um, short of an incredibly immoral situation happening in front of me, there's not a lot of things I can think of where my burst of anger wouldn't be life-centered, if that makes sense. If I saw somebody, like, take a baseball bat to a kid, that burst of anger doesn't need to be quelled or let go of. I need to go stop that person from beating this child with a baseball bat, right? That's just, I need to, I need to take the motivation offered to me by the anger and go handle it. Um, but the rest of the times in my life where I'm like, if I'm angry at my husband, if I'm angry at a friend or a coworker or a, a, a client, or if I'm a guest at my workplace, oftentimes if I've been practicing my mindfulness meditation and my sense of being present in the moment, there are no bursts of anger. That's all, I'm very aware of the rising and flow of the anger and I can let it pass through me and I accept that awareness and can move past it if I'm if I'm like on on point I'm not always on point but if I'm on point <laughs> that's what happens <laughs> um, and this has been true in a lot of variety of work situations I've had uh, I've worked at Starbucks I've worked in a middle school and a high school I've worked in the community center I've worked for Walgreens um, I've worked in a variety of situations with a variety of people, and in all these cases, if I'm really aware and present in the moment, no matter how outlandish the behavior that bur spurs the anger inside of me, it very rarely comes at a surprise if you are being mindful and aware of yourself and, your e and what's going on in your brain place. Granted, situations will take you out of that awareness and mindfulness. It'll definitely rip you from the present. The situations absolutely happen. But practice usually makes it easier to get back into it. But here to uh, bring up kind of something about the first sentence under self-indulgent anger reminds me again where we were talking about unmet expectations. When we measure our well-being by the extent to which we remain we maintain our requirements about the way we need to be or the world needs to be, then we are likely to be disappointed. And so you get attached to these uh, expectations, right? And then when they fail you, you get disappointed, you get angry. Um, the world needs to, when the world fails, there's a good chance we'll react out in anger. 
<laughs> I think that would be where anger is used for protection, where I think it's okay for certain situations. I just hate to yell at my daughter sometimes. I taught her to tell me not to yell in the future. Oh, Well, I think having that clear communication is really good with your daughter. Um, first off, kudos about being willing to admit failure to your child. I think that's where a lot of uh, adults fail children is this unwillingness to seem less than perfect to them. And so kudos to you on that. Um, beyond that, that's really hard. And that's also, immediately I'm like, oh, that's an unmet expectation you're probably reacting to. Um, because you get attached to this idea that the child should know how to do X. And so that's an attachment we get we cling to right when the reality is when we take into perspective the length of their lifespan compared to our own as an adult is shockingly different right they're just number of experiences they have lived and the novelty of the experience to them is actually shocking and so where i have experienced closing my finger in a door like hundreds of times now in my life a 12 year old may have only done once right and so that's shockingly fewer number of experiences um i'm not saying people just go slamming their doors fingers and doors like i do accidentally because they're not aware of their bodies for some reason i can't always yes i talk to her as much as i can about why i act out sometimes i tell her so that she can have better understanding when it happens with others i hope you continue that open dialogue with your daughter and um continue to grow um, I think you're on a really good path to developing very healthy. I'm sure you, I, I have no comment on the health of your relationship now. People make mistakes. We're humans. Sometimes we forget to act with kindness. And it just happens. She's 10. It's fantastic. Oh, that's a good age. That's a really good age. So I've worked with all sorts of ages. Um, I don't have children of my own, but I have, uh, I've worked in a daycare with children as young as six months old. And I'm a teacher who works with all other age ranges in between and so um and then at the facility i work at we have a lot of guests in the variety of age ranges all the way through 90 years old so i feel like i feel like i've dealt with quite a few people of all sorts of types right and uh 10 is a really good fun age in my opinion especially one-on-one -on -one. about 12 or 13 you don't want to deal with the child in like in like a group about 12 or 13 you don't want like multiple of them to interact with but like one-on-one -on -one, solid age <laughs> that's my personal opinion <laughs> like they they get a weird like dumb like a herd dumb like a there's like a herd mentality but it's dumb once they get to like 12 or 13 and it lasts until about 14 or 15 or 16 sometimes but one-on-one -on -one, still a good age range um i, I don't know why Bless you for that. I can't imagine being surrounded with 13-year-olds. Um, I'm very fortunate. I, I work in a non-traditional um, non setting. I typically work with homeschool students uh, now. I have worked in the public school system, but uh, the last couple of years I've been working in the homeschool sector and uh, in a more... And when I do work with public school students, in a, it's in a more voluntary setting. So the kids who come to me aren't there because they've been forced to. They're there because they told their mom or dad, I really want to go to this art class. <laughs> and so I'm, I, it already eases a lot of the interaction because there's no like tension with them of like, I really don't want to be here. I don't know why I'm here. And so especially, even with the homeschoolers, almost no parents sign their kids up for my art class if the kid has been like no i hate art please don't make me go i've had one kid that happened to it was an interesting learning experience but um eases my interactions and so then <laughs> how can you hate art this hate structure that just comes down to structure uh they were they were going through some developmental issues uh some severe adhd so they were still kind of this was their mo since my classes were so short and it wasn't a full school day or anything that she was just having the child practice being in a more structured environment um which i totally was there to support and we both agreed like when the child decides like 100 percent they were done uh i let them walk out of the room and meet her in a different part of the building um so ended up being really cool um, i'm really excited to offer those sort of opportunities for kiddos where we can kind of figure out where they're at developmentally i but i hope he's doing okay i haven't talked to that kid in a while <laughs> as i think about this now oh yeah 
the kid with the severe ADHD. <laughs> a little bit of anger issues. Uh, fun fact for anyone who doesn't know, severe ADHD can be often accompanied with a sense of perfectionism, which adds to their uh, frustration. I think it uh, it's like a two-handed, like, terrifying mess to be to be in there mentally. I can't even. Yeah. <laughs> Self-indulgence and anger can also occur as denial. I thought that was interesting. I hadn't thought about that before reading this. Um, many of the religious isms, including Buddhism, can be practiced in such a way as to suggest that if we experience anger, we are not enlightened. We can push the experience of anger away in any number of ways, avoiding confrontation at any cost. Blah, blah, blah. We may cower in the face of another's anger or measure out our involvement in the world by obsessively planning out our lives, picking the right partner, working at the right job, etc. So then you like, but no plan goes perfectly, right? So we, we're still faced with unmet expectations, we're met with uh, disappointment from life, and we create a form of self imprisonment. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I loved, was typing, but off topic, so never mind, the topic is very useful. It's okay. Um, I'm, I'm chill with going off topic. Uh, I am fine. I'm pretty flexible with things. We learn lots of ways to push anger away. Do, do, do. Prohibition against. So this this gets back into my personal like frustration with talking about anger. Um, people take this precept as a prohibition against all anger, pointing hurtful results of his indulgence. I think if we keep in mind that our aspiration is to respond rather than to react to conditions and situations, then we can approach this precept not as prohibition against all anger but as an invitation to explore the difference which i thought was a lovely sentiment um i'm gonna highlight that real quick Boom. um lovely sentiment that it's not about just letting it react it's responding to the situ situation and approaching it with an i guess an explorative mind um springs out of old patterns of thinking and perceiving um do not serve life blah 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 da, 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 da. Da. much like many other skills i think that buddhism and this sense of being able to catch your anger before it like explodes out of your body just is stupid and how much practice it takes <laughs> was going to say that having to work from home, Zoom classes are lacking, so I started working with Khan Academy. I love Khan Academy! Oh, yes. I love Khan Academy. Excellent stuff. Um, Khan Academy, big inspiration for me. It's been amazing, and she's making quick progress. I wish I can homeschool more. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look at the statistics... Oh, where are they? Um, there's, this there's this chart. Um, homeschooling by age group. Homeschooling by age group numbers per day. So um, there is actually a weird fact about the hours per day, depending on how old your kid is. And so people think like, why do I gotta have an eight hour day, right? But that's ridiculous. If your child's between nine to 12, the maximum, like, anyway, the hours are not eight hours a day. You don't want your child like trying to force words and all of this knowledge on their brain that many hours a day so if you really if you super wanted to homeschool you could totally do it it takes I could go on about how well I think homeschooling is a great idea and I wish everybody had the uh, financial capacity to ma to pull it off based on what you're saying though I, I surmise that possibly you're only uh, you're temporarily working from home this isn't a permanent situation so um, yes, so catching your anger is one of the things that definitely makes DBT and Buddhism very similar prints. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I surmise that's a temporary situation for you. So, sorry to hear that, but I'm really glad to hear your kids taken to Khan Academy. They have some excellent materials there. Hashtag not sponsored, but guys, check it out. <laughs> if you want to just learn some junk. I've used it uh, when I was teaching in the public school and I had to get some art history into some of my students. I would assign them videos to watch uh, on their own time and write like a couple of responses to or something. It's good. It's good material. It's good stuff. There's a, there's a couple who does some like tours of paintings from museums and stuff. It's a cute little series. 
if you like art history. Um, so the practice. What was that? Uh, there's a tours. There's a there's a couple who has videos on Khan Academy in the art history section, and they uh, they talk about a lot of paintings and stuff, and their commentary is pretty good. So I like them. If you're into art history and stuff, it's pretty pretty worth a look. Um. Okay, so the practice of this precept. So the first step of practicing with habitual patterns of mind and body is to allow an open inquiry into their workings. That's a lot of big grown-up words. And so <laughs> uh, just having this open engagement with the workings of your anger and um, the beacon of the light, right? And this shimmering. This is a lot of words. This is a lot of flowy language. This, the author has suddenly started using <laughs> this paragraph. Um, it can be very frightening, right? And it's a moment of presence that you have to bring to the table. Um, so it's important for us to first discover where we stand with anger, right? What is our relationship with anger? The author's brought this up a couple times, but this is where they really start to get into it. <laughs> yeah, they did. They were suddenly very inspired by writing. I, I agree, Prince. That's probably what happened. Sudden burst of writing inspiration. I was like, ah, I know all the words now. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's a good part. And then I think, yeah, we're getting to the last two sections. So the last section is a theoretical conversation that I'm not actually going to go over personally. And then this one section of deepening the inquiry, I only had a chance to read once. So bear with me. The other sections I wrote, I read like three or four times to try to absorb them. And then this section, I've only had the time to read once. And so, um... Right off the bat, the author suggests becoming curious about what triggers your anger as you go about your daily activities. Uh, so for instance, Prince, as a parent, you uh, can, I believe, break down into a category, probably even make like a paper list if you really wanted to, if you're into that sort of thing, list making, I often do that, that's how I, I work through thoughts is uh, setting out like, what are the exact actions that are bringing you to those moments of bursts of anger? Um, there's a, what events set anger into motion for you? Someone cuts you off on the freeway, your daughter throws a hot air balloon at your head. I don't know. People don't throw hot air balloons, do they? That's not a thing people do. I don't know why I said that. Okay, so, <laughs> so someone cuts you off on the freeway. Uh, there's a moment of madness. You make a rude gesture. You know, there's nothing positive or helpful about your reaction, but you get some sense of satisf satisfaction. It's a momentary satisfaction. I imagine it's the same um, when dealing with uh, children or even other human beings. We see a lot of videos anymore on the internet of, of customers just going haywire, right? Like, they just, they just yell at the uh, customer service representative, and they just, like lose their minds and it's a momentary satisfaction on their part but it'll be taken away right it take it, it takes but you have the intention to be open observant you'll begin to pick up what thoughts are present when the energy arises so that's what i'm talking about mindfulness right like it's easy to pick up like when your mind starts going towards that state of mind as you learn to see them along the way and like you said prince absolutely this is where dbt and Buddhism are hand in hand, like skipping down the lane of flowers, having a great time together and saying, yeah, we know what's up. <laughs> um, so things will happen. First, you remember to turn. Uh, then you will judge it. I shouldn't be thinking this way. Why did I did it again? Oh, my gosh. Um, you may also find that the thoughts develop into a story, right? about who did what and so forth. And this happens when you finally notice you've been off into a story. You're in a story, you're getting attached, right? You're forming an expectation about what happened in the situation, what should have happened, what didn't happen. And you just make, you need to make a mental note of the thought, repeating it, um, repeating it, having a thought that blank. By keeping the intention to not try to solve anything, but to allow awareness of that type of thinking triggers anger reactions you will begin to experience a little space in which your awareness can deepen so that your experience resonates in space. Your particular pattern of thinking and feeling around anger will emerge. Be patient. You can recognize years of collected requirements in just a few exercises. Um, so absolutely, uh, this deepening of the inquiry, right? Like this slowing down, instead of telling yourself a narrative and beating yourself up over a situation, use it as a learning experience. All right. 
I had this repeating thought. I'm going to keep this intention. I'm going to go in with every interaction with the intention to be open to be observant of not just like what's happening between me and the other person, but like what's going on inside me. And so that you can recognize these requirements in your head that you've worked on, these, these expectations, these attachments, whatever words you want to use. You get, you get into that. Um, he tells a little analogy about a, per about a co-worker. Post office practicing observing anger when people criticized him. At first, he tried to stop, look and listen to all the angry uprisings at work, but found it impossible because they were so frequent. So instead, he decided to just focus on inter interactions with people who brought, bought stamps. Every time a person ordered a stamp, that was the signal for him to pay attention. Oops. So, yeah, I love that idea of using something mundane to help signal to you, hey, you aren't paying attention. I like to think of it sort of like that... <laughs> <laughs> sort of like that movie Inception where they have to use their little totems to remind them that they're asleep or they're not in the waking world. And so you create like a totem with an, a, a mundane action. And so this male cleric utilized um, the action of somebody coming in to buy stamps. When, it's, when they came in, then that was like, oh, I got to pay attention. I'm not paying attention. Um, if he was criticizing the counter, he hit the jackpot. If not, he would just move on to the next person. Over time, what was interesting was that by not imposing an impossible task on himself, he naturally began to observe his reactions to criticism of people who ordered priority mail or had complaints about their delivery. Once engaged, the beacon of light of attention lights up our object. It begins to spread wide. A lot of words. A lot of stuff going on here. I think it was really hard when I first read this to kind of parse apart all of the thoughts. I'm only really forming some of my opinions as I'm talking right now. Um, so it's funny how I think these sentences are simplistic, but the meaning is kind of like complex. Um, once you more frequently notice your reactions, it is important to allow their presence. Don't shove them. That's, that's a bad habit people get into. My mouse wasn't working for a second. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to bump that Putin. I didn't mean to hit the Putin. Okay. Having a thought that I'm still getting angry over blank, or I don't feel anything that I should, what begins to emerge over time is an understanding of the ways in which we indulge in anger. Sometimes people will say that they know they are angry, but don't have a feeling in their body. Be patient. It takes time sometimes for the mind to connect the thoughts with the body. And so that's where I think DBT once again steps in and says, um, just because you're not aware of what's happening in your body leading up to the anger or at the moment of anger doesn't mean it's not happening. You just have to spread it wide your awareness to it, right? Um, there are many practices to help us make that connection. Working with the teacher. Um, signal. Don't demand an answer. I think that's really important in Buddhism. And life. When we're on these journeys. Is that the, it's not always like... The answer is X. Boom. I want that answer. I have to solve for X. I demand that answer. Don't do that. The question is an invitation to feel. And for some of us, this is new and frightening. Just open, invite, and want to reveal. Have the wanting of, for the um, revealing to come to the surface. Do, 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 try to relax and rest. Uh, so this lax section, I think for you, uh, Prince, would be kind of what you asked me earlier. Does it go into... How to do it? Yes. This last section called, um, once again, called Deepening the Inquiry is a way more practical section. Absolutely talks more about how to do X, Y, Z. How do I handle this situation? Um, what are some practical things I can do to try it? So I think this little last section is really good. Um, sometimes we come to recognize an experience of anger that is not event-oriented, but rather a subtle simmer that appears to be ever-present. I've had that before. The chapter is called Want. Oh, the actual chapter we're reading is called I Take Up the Way of Letting Go of Anger. And then the subsection inside of that chapter is called Deepening the Inquiry. <laughs> and so that one is the most practical. So if you were like, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff and just read this one thing, I'd probably go for Deepening the Inquiry. And uh, in, in that chapter. So... If, you, if you're like, I just don't, I don't have time to read a lot, go for that section. It's got the practice, it's got the primary thing you were asking about earlier in it. <laughs> if you notice this when you are waking up, it may blah, blah. Yeah, it's very practical advice now. It's just, 
As our ability to be present in the experience of what we are calling anger develops, the label of anger itself disappears, and what we are left with is just a sensation of energy, which I think is a beautiful conclusion for this to get into, right? It's this, is like, this realization that anger is, you can just be quantified as a type of energy that motivates us and pushes us into an action, right? And so, oh, so interesting. Yes. And then... And over time, we find that we can be quiet, quite still and calm in the middle of the storm. We will begin to feel a sense of open space and subtle changes as the energy moves and transforms and finally is no longer something we label as anger. And so I just a gorgeous ending to this to this uh, section to me. I know that there's technically that conversations that happens next, but I don't count that as the ending as a chapter personally. I'm just I'm, I'm biased. But this gorgeous ending of that the anger is a sensation of energy and that it can move us and it can transform us or we can push with it and use it to our advantage or be calm in its presence. 